Hey, what's up everybody? Chad Kalick here and welcome to episode number four of the In a Crowded Room podcast, which today I'm going to be talking about a very controversial gentleman named Alex Jones. If you know who Alex Jones is, let me start by saying that this is not going to be a political podcast per se. I don't care if you're Democratic, if you're Republican, if you're Independent, if you're non-political at all that doesn't really matter to me and uh, the subject matter here is not going to be about who you'd vote for and who you support politically um, but what it's going to be about in general is a very scary event that happened to mr alex jones and uh maybe i'm alone in thinking that it's scary um but alex jones came on my mind this morning because i turned on my YouTube channel and my first recommended video was all about Alex Jones going crazy and attacking Joe Rogan and waging war on him. Um, and they're longtime friends, like 20 year friends. And this happened because a while ago, it was a month or two ago, uh, maybe even longer than that, in a single sweep, Alex Jones, who is a conspiracy theorist, uh, a big supporter of Donald Trump. Um, he is basically an independent journalist that started um, a company called Infowars. And they, you know, report news and what they believe to be news. And uh, they're just like the Young Turks. They're an independent news channel that have been grouped in the far right. And Alex Jones, his history, um, it, it's interesting that he is viewed as a far right voice because, uh, Although he supports Trump in the past, he's been completely against Bush. Um, then he was against Obama. So he always seemed to kind of be against whoever was in power historically. Uh, but for whatever reason, it lined up where, you know, he, he supported Trump. And a big reason he supported Trump is because he felt as though Donald Trump was uh, anti-establishment. And Jones has always had an anti-establishment um, viewpoint. Uh, that's been consistent throughout his career. Um, let me also say, I'm not a fan of Alex Jones. Um, he's wildly entertaining because he says the craziest things. He's a massive conspiracy theorist. And there have been things that he's uh, reported on first and hit on in the past and was right. But there's a massive amount of information that he's released out into the world that has been wrong. Um, well, uh, getting back to what I was saying earlier, a few months ago, in a sweeping move... He was deplatformed, meaning he was kicked off Twitter, off Facebook, off Spotify, um, off YouTube. All these separate companies decided to take his voice away. And the thing that they pointed at was his criticism of the Sandy Hook shooting, where all those children were shot. And Alex Jones started investigating it, and with the help of a guy that had some kind of strings or ties to the CIA that was talking to Alex about this. Um, he convinced Alex that Sandy Hook was a false flag, that it never happened. None of it, that none of the children were shot, that the parents were actors, um, that the media just staged the entire event. And he carried on with this for probably two or three months. And he started receiving some massive, massive blowback from this, including, uh, you know, all kinds of legal cases. People were suing him. Um, I mean, imagine being somebody who lost a child in that and you had this very powerful voice. Because um, Alex Jones' media Infowars reaches something like 40 million people worldwide. It's really impressive what he's built. But imagine if you lost your child and... This guy's out there saying you're a liar and you're a crisis actor and, you know, you're paid uh, to, to pretend. Um, now, like any event like this, uh, any big tragic event, there's always things that, that don't add up. And that's why I, I, for the most part, I don't like conspiracy theorists, like people who are known of, of just being, you know, believing in every conspiracy known to man, you know, like. Uh, there are people out there that are like, they, you know, they believe the world is flat. You know, Sandy Hook never happened. They believe in Pizzagate. Uh, they believe in everything. 
Um, and what I think is kind of dangerous about that train of thought, and, and I, I use dangerous meaning um, not as literally uh, dangerous, I guess what I mean is to say that you miss out on truth, I guess, if you just adhere to every single conspiracy theory known to man. Whenever a crazy event happens, there's going to be an exchange of information that moves lightning fast, especially in today's world. With social media, it's just information flies. And a lot of stuff that is initially reported is wrong because, you know, the truth gets worked out over time. So it's pretty easy whenever something big happens right away to say, well, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. So it's, it's a big conspiracy. When the truth is there are real conspiracies in the world. There are, uh, you know, definitely powerful groups that do uh, nefarious things to take control over certain situations. Um, but there's not nearly as many conspiracy theories as people like Alex Jones would like you to believe. Um, having said that, as the heat came down on Alex more and more and more about Sandy Hook, uh, he changed his stance and he started saying, now, uh, I never said that it didn't happen. I said that there were things about it that made me question it, and I don't know if it happened. And uh, a lot of people were like, listen, you can't roll backwards, man. You said it over and over again. You're on a film saying it. Now, because heat's coming your way, you're trying to change you know, the narrative. And um, so eventually, out of the blue, what was weird about the deplatforming of Alex Jones is it's not like there was anything new that happened. The, uh, you know, him stating that Sandy Hook wasn't real happened a long time ago, months and months ago. Um, so it's not like he came out, said it, hurt people, and then he was deplatformed. Um, it just happened months after he did this, and it happened simultaneously with all of these companies. And it very much appeared like, you know, Twitter got together with Instagram, got together with Spotify, got together with, uh, you know, Facebook and YouTube. And I know a couple of these companies own multiple of those companies, but it was like, you know, three or four powers that be combined to take this man's voice away. And now there are people that will say, well, no one's taking his voice away. He can still say whatever he wants. Well, yes, but in the world we live in, social media um, it has become, you know, an active part of our daily life. It's become an active part of being vocal. So to take that away, uh, if you take social media away from a man who makes his living off sharing his thoughts, you know, in a lot of ways you're you're, you're taking, um, you know, a big part of that man's life away. And over time. Uh, you know, he's going to keep losing money because he built a machine um, that could sustain all the audience that he had. So if he loses 40 million followers, uh, sure, he has millions and millions of dollars uh, saved up, but it's going to go pretty fast. Um, and it seemed as though that this was the plan. OK, it seemed as though um, the far left and the social media conglomerates decided they did not want to hear his far right propaganda anymore. And they just decided to deplatform him. And what's scary about that is the one thing that makes this country the most amazing country, uh, you know, in the world is our ability to speak freely about what we think. And not just in our own house to sit around and speak how we feel, but to share our thoughts with the public. That's how, you know, we as the public also determine what we agree and don't agree with. And, you know, the, the First Amendment is not there to protect popular speech. It's there to protect unpopular speech. I don't agree with Alex Jones. I don't know. I don't like most of what he says. Again, I think he's uh, way over the top. He's super crazy off the religious, you know, deep end. Um you know, his message does not resonate with me um, at all. But, you know, I, I turned on uh, Bill Maher one night, who, and I watch, uh, I do watch some Alex Jones stuff, and I also watch Bill Maher. And I don't agree with everything Bill Maher says. I mean, he's super far left, completely atheist, um, you know, just you're either with him or you're against him type of stuff. Uh, but Bill Maher walked out and he said, 
you know, basically, you know, people have taken away Alex Jones's voice and, and Bill Maher said, you know, as somebody who has been lied about many times by Alex Jones, uh, you know, it's not right. He gets to speak too. you know, he should have a voice in this. And, um, again, the reason I think that's so important is because that's how we as a society, uh, fight back with speech. When we hear something we don't like, we all collectively speak our mind and that collective, you know, um, determines an overall voice. And that's how ideas get shot down. That's how ideas get developed. That's how ideas, you know, get perfected. Um, it's important. It's probably the most important thing, uh, is to have a voice. You know, I'm not in the political you know, spectrum, but as a filmmaker, that's my voice. My documentary is my voice. Um, even this podcast is me having a voice, uh, you know, sharing my thoughts about fun stuff, sports, um, you know, music, things like that. All of that, you know, is locked in that collective of free speech. And the reason this hit me maybe stronger than most, was a very, very personal story that I want to share with you. Uh, when I was in college, I was an entertainment column writer. Um, I was a sports editor. I covered the Iowa State Cyclones football team and the basketball team and the baseball team and, and most of the major sports I would cover. Um, but as a side gig for fun, I would write entertainment columns, and that would include going to concerts and things like that. Um, as a musician at that time, that was also touring and playing music. It was just a lot of fun. Uh, it didn't really pay much, but I got to go to shows for free, etc. And I had gone to the Lilith Fair. It's hard for me to say. It's a tongue twister word. The Lilith Fair uh, at that time. And that festival was very much uh, um, an intended and intentionally uh, uh, celebrated festival for, for female artists. And um, pretty much all of the major acts that were there were were uh, fronted by female vocalists, um, or there was a member of the band that was a really known female artist, and it was a celebration of women, uh, specifically in rock. And and listen, I I was one hundred percent down with that. I mean, I went to the concert, I went to the Lilith Fair, I went to the show. But what kind of turned me off when I was there? was the celebration of these incredible artists as incredible female artists, not just incredible artists. And I, I remember thinking at the show, man, this is a real bummer that there's, there's still separation between, are you a great singer? Or are you a great female singer? Because a singer is a singer in my mind. A great song is a great song. Like when I go to my music to listen to something, I don't go, you know, today I'm going to listen to female-fronted rock because I want to hear some good, you know, woman rock. You know, I, I don't. I just want to, I just want to hear some good music. And if that's Pat Benatar or Cardi B, I don't go, man, that's some great female shit. You know what I mean? Um, so I wrote this column that was basically saying. You know, I went to the, the little fair and what is unfortunate about it, you know, it's just celebrated as this, you know, female concert. And that's the thing that people, you know, point at is that these women are, are putting this on. And I said, you know, think how weird that would be if there was a concert that celebrated men. And, and we were like, all the bands here tonight are men. They all have penises. And if you don't like that, go to the Little Fair because they all have vaginas, you know? And, and it was this very kind of like tongue in cheek. I was like having fun with it, but I was making the point that I was let down by the fact that society was still labeling and that I didn't feel as though um, the era of a true equality would be reached until we could speak about who's good without labeling what their sex was. Because again, I don't care when I hear a song, uh, I don't care if the band, if everybody in the band has vaginas versus everybody, you know, having a dick, like none of that matters to me. Like, I just don't, I, I don't see gender when I listen to music. And 
I feel like sometimes, and especially how I felt back then, sometimes pushing an agenda gives that agenda strength. And uh, what I mean by that agenda strength is they were saying this is a celebration of womanhood, you know, at, at this concert. But we'll, but now that's what we're looking at. And we're not realizing that it should just be a celebration of ability. And this was very pro, you know, woman. I, I totally had their back. And that's what I was trying to get across. Well, I show up the next day. And my uh, editor-in-chief calls me in and says the uh, Iowa State Committee on Women, it was this committee that were about you know, female rights. Tara Deering was her name, editor-in-chief, and she said, they're raging. Like, you just pissed some people off. You know, they think that, you know, you're basically not acknowledging that it's been difficult for women to rise in music. And, uh, you know, you're not acknowledging the stance uh, that the little affair has taken by supporting female artists and you're just coming off very chauvinistic and at first I thought it was a joke I was just like oh come on this is not real and they're like no they're they're really upset in fact they they want you fired and I'm like whoa 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 hold on do they understand that I'm on their core I'm on their team like I'm saying that these artists are so good that it's a tragedy that we're talking about, you know, their gender and not the music. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not saying that they should be celebrated. I'm saying that as long as we, do, you know, draw a line in the sand, there's going to be a line in the sand. And, you know, Tara's like, well, they're not seeing it this way. And then a flood of hate mail came in. And I was like, wow. I mean, it was people that were just trashing me. And uh, and then something happened that really hurt. Because this was back when people would post letters to the editor. So they're posting all these, you know, Chad Kalick hatred letters from women. And then someone specifically started questioning, you know, whether or not, you know, what kind of boyfriend I was to Laura. Because I was very public about my relationship with Laura. And he basically wrote this article like saying I was a monster and, you know, how could, you know, Laura be with someone like me? And it, it was just really, really below the belt stuff. All because I was actually trying to say something positive and support the, the, the female movement by saying that they were above labels. And, um, but no one wanted to hear that. This was not a time period. This was back in like, geez, it had been like 95, 96. This is way before social media. So there I am. And I'm hearing from, you know, Tara that there's this big push and movement to fire me. That, you know, what I wrote was sexist and a university and newspaper should not be publishing sexist material. And I was so sad. I was so freaking sad so I went home and I started thinking so what can I do about this what can I do and uh, I decided I'm gonna write an article in response I'm gonna you know really lay it out there and just say first off you know everybody that's attacking me about Laura I mean anybody who knows me knows that that girl is my heart and soul. She is my best friend. She is the foundation of, of all things good in my life. You know, um, if anybody thinks for any second that, you know, I would, uh, mistreat her in any fashion or, or, or treat her like she's less than she is. First off, it's an insult again to her, uh, because you're assuming a lack of intelligence and a lack of pride in herself, like she would just be with someone that was terrible and just be like, listen, you have no idea, you know, how much this woman means to me and how much she has taught me about being a better person. Um, and then I was going to get into, you know, my, you know, own experiences playing live music and going to shows and opening up for people and, and also point out that some of my favorite artists of all time were female. So I, I didn't really, you know, from Janis Joplin to Pat Benatar, 
I mean, there's just there's just so many that were so good. I mean, I, I grew up listening to Diana Ross. I mean, thinking that was one of the most beautiful voices I had ever heard. Um, you know, even into to hip hop, I was a, a fan of uh, you know MC Light. Uh, there was I mean, there was just there was a lot of females that that were in music that I listened to. Um, at that time, you know, I was even listening to Hole. I mean, Courtney Love's album had just come out, and uh, there was a, a lot of cool music that was uh, female. Liz Fair, I was a big fan of. So I was going to include that in this article, and I was going to really stress that, you know, also that I that if I offended someone, you know, through my choice of words, then, I, then I'm sorry. Because I also learned then one of the most difficult things about writing is sentiment. It's hard to drive home sentiment with text. It's really hard. And I thought if this is happening, it's probably happening because, uh, you know, I'm not that great of a writer right now. And I'm trying to get complex thoughts across, you know, with, with just black and white text. So maybe part of this is my fault. Um, but I was going to write this whole big article, like defending myself, so I felt better. I was like, okay, I'm super sad, but here's a plan. There's a way to really make people see, you know, what I felt and what I was trying to do. And so nobody thinks that I'm this monster that like hates women or something. And uh, so I show up and I'm, I'm like stoked, you know, I, I decide I'm going to go knock on Tara Deering's door and uh, that's the editor in chief and just tell her my plans and this is what I'm going to do. And hopefully it'll take the heat off her to fire me uh, because that's what is going on. I mean, there are uh, people that were talking about forming a protest to get me fired. I mean, it was crazy stuff. It was, it was PCU. It was like this big group of women that hated me. And uh, I was just like, oh my God, you know? So I tell Tara all of this and she says, well, there's, you know, I got two pieces of information for you. One um, you know, I got to meet with our journalism instructors to discuss your future. And I'm like, what? And she's like, yes. And two, there was some class. Uh, it was, uh, women's studies, like 201 or something. And this class invited me uh, to come to their class to have an open debate about, you know, the column that I wrote. And, Look, I, if I felt like it would have been an open, fair debate, I would have went. Um, but I, I didn't think it would be. I figured it would be just a big Chad bash session. So I didn't go. Um, but what bothered me more and was more terrifying is that this meeting was going to be happening with the entire journalism department to determine my future at the Iowa State Daily. Now, keep in mind, Tara Deering is a, a, an amazing girl. I've always, always liked her. Uh, but she's female. Uh, she's also African-American. Um, so she's dealt with a lot of shit in her life. And I'm sitting here going, oh my God, I haven't even thought about this. Like, this has got to be really hard for her having, you know, uh, being not only a woman, but uh, an African-American woman that has just dealt with, you know, all kinds of injustice forever. And then there's this thing that I wrote that people are totally misunderstanding, but they're claiming that I'm one thing that I'm not. And she knows that, but, you know, th does she want to show up with this headache? I mean, this is a chance for her to bring her hammer down on my head and silence me and not let me ever write that explanation article. So I, I, I went home and I waited until the following day. And it was a terrible 24 hours because I'm like, oh, man, if, if I don't ever get the chance to really clear this up, I mean, I am going to freak out. I mean, I'm not any of these terrible things. I was speaking for women in their favor. That's what I was doing. And uh, so it was a long night. And I woke up the next morning and I drove into work not knowing what my fate was. So right before I walked into the daily, on the outside of the daily, they had a stand with newspapers. And I grabbed the stand and I go right to editorial to see if uh, they posted any more letters to the editor. And there was no more letters to the editor, but there was this long um, page length article 
by Tara Deering. And it brought tears to my eyes. I mean, I, I'm getting, thinking about it right now, I mean, I'm getting teary eyed because she had my back. And she went on to basically say, you know, I would have chosen different words than what Chad chose. I'm not even necessarily a fan of his content in general, but I am a fan of, of people having the right to speak because it's up to you and us, the public, uh, to fight speech that we don't like with speech that's critical of that speech. And then that person gets the chance to refute that and come back and speak. And that's how we have conversation. You know, we can't live in a world where we just punish people for having thoughts. And she basically said what I was thinking the whole time is, you know, the first amendment doesn't exist to protect popular speech. Um, it exists to protect speech that you might find offensive. That might be minority speech. And in my case, she knew that I wasn't even speaking minority speech. She just knew that it was a misunderstanding. So at the very end of it, she you know, pretty much said, you know, Chad earned his way to that column. He's a very popular writer. People like him. They follow him. The reason this is in the public eye is because of that. Now, whether you like him or not, you can't deny that. And he has the right to speak on this. And he has the right to answer your letters to the editor. And it was such a powerful thing. It was such a powerful thing to be able to have a voice to, you know, to fight back and to say, no, 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 you, you misunderstand. I'm actually agreeing with you. I'm on your team. Like, you know, like, uh, I'm not against you. I'm not speaking badly against women. I'm not, you know, denying uh, the difficulties that women have had in the music business. I'm not denying any of that. I'm saying I want to get to a place where we don't care about what, you know, gender someone is, that we just judge them on their talent. And, and I, I saw Tara that day and I walked in and I sat down in her office and it was, it was very quiet and we just kind of sat there and I was very emotional and I had tears in my eyes and I didn't really say much and I was kind of quiet and I looked up and, and I just said, Tara, I just, I really want to thank you. You know, this means, a lot to me, you know, that you would, that you would not let somebody take my voice away, that you would give me the chance to, to speak up. And, uh, she just looked at me and she said, Chad, you know, you, you deserve that. I know you're not a bad guy. I know what you meant. Uh, but now you got a chance, you know, to go out and, and explain to people. And, uh, you know, I hope you take the time to make sure that you do a good job of that, you know? And, uh, that was about all we really said. I just thanked her again and told her that she was a very, you know, a, a very amazing person. And, and I did, I went on to write and explain what I, what I meant and it all blew over. I mean, it was all ultimately fine. I mean, yeah, there were hangers on that still just no matter what I said from that point, wanted to crucify me, but, you know, I would say 95% of people totally understood where I was coming from when I had the chance to just address the letters to the editor, to just address it. So when I look back, I go, man, had I never been able to do that in the minds of so many people, I would have just been a monster. You know? That's terrifying. Now, I'm not drawing a direct correlation to Alex Jones here, but what I'm saying is, I agree, Alex Jones gets to speak too. What if Alex Jones is totally wrong about everything he's saying? And what if through people condemning his words, he's forced to reevaluate things and, he, and he's forced to realize that he's going to do a better job of getting ideas out there? What if he changes his thoughts and ideas? What if he says, God, maybe I was wrong about this? You know, what if he later, you know, becomes a defender for things that he once condemned? Like when you take away that voice, you're taking away all of these, all of these possibilities. They're just gone now. 
you know? And as far as him saying that he thinks Sandy Hook and things like that were fake, I think that's horrible. I think it's horrible that he would say that. And I can't, I can't imagine losing a child and having to hear somebody say that. But that's why we, as the public, have free speech. To condemn his speech through our voices, through standing up, through saying, no, you can't just say that. You have to provide rock-hard proof. And you have to apologize to these families. And you have to make it right. And if, you, and if you're not going to, we're turning the channel, man. There's all these possibilities. And when you take away that free speech, you take away infinite possibilities. And it was crazy to me that a bunch of companies all to, you know, got together and simultaneously just started taking away all his, his public speech platforms. And why him? I can tell you right now, there's a ton of alt-left people that say crazy stuff. Just as crazy as the alt-righters. You know? So who decides who can no longer speak? Who, des who decides who shouldn't have a platform? Who decides what speech is too much? Too dangerous? That's an incredible power. That's an incredible power. And again, the argument of, well, no one's silencing him. You know, it's not a right to have these things. No, it's not in our Constitution that's a right to have social media. But it's offered to everybody in the public. And it's, it's how, I mean, it's how people speak. To, it's how the president speaks to the public today. I mean, think tomorrow. What if Trump or any president suddenly had the power to say, you don't have a voice, take away their platforms. Think how many things that could be done to you and you don't have the ability to let the public know. It's terrifying to me what happened to Alex Jones. And it should not be allowed. If people have dangerous speech and they're inciting things, uh, riots, anything like that, we have laws for you know hate speech and hate crimes and and for speech that incites violence. We you know that's covered. So if there's one thing that I hope in the future we see the public lash out against, Regardless of your views on, you know, political policies or social justice, I hope we see the public completely lash out against any of these companies who take away a person's ability to have a platform and to speak publicly. We all get to speak. Because together, we will all decide what's acceptable and what's not. Not two or three people. That's way too much power to be in just, you know, a small group of people's hands. It's way too much power. We all get to decide together. I hope you enjoyed episode number four of the In a Crowded Room podcast. I will be back tomorrow with more. Have a good night.